Welcome to Trithi Matra. Uh, Bangladesh and the United Kingdom have history ties and uh, traditionally friendly relations. Uh, the UK was among the first country, European countries to recognize uh, Bangladesh uh, on 4th February 1972, uh, which influenced a quick recognition by other Commonwealth and Western countries. Uh, soon after Bangladesh became a member of the Commonwealth on 18th April 1972. To discuss uh, the state of Bangladesh-United Kingdom uh, relations and uh, deliberate the potential for the future, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome to today's show Mr. Robert Chatterton Dixon, British High Commissioner to Bangladesh. Uh, Robert Chatterton Dixon has been British High Commissioner in Dhaka since March 2019. Previously, he served as additional director Western Balkans program in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, a director in the National Security Secretariat in the Cabinet uh, Office, head of the Secretariat team supporting the National Security Council and the National Security Advisor, Deputy Ambassador and Church Affairs at the British Embassy in Kabul and Consul General in Chicago, USA. Mr. High Commissioner, welcome Thank to the show. Much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. High Commissioner, it has been uh, three years since you joined your office uh, in Bangladesh so far. Uh, how is your experience in uh, Bangladesh uh, and uh, what are your general thoughts about the nation of uh, Bangladesh and her people? Have you found anything in particular interest uh, in, your, in our nation? Well, I've had an absolutely wonderful time in Bangladesh. Uh, it's now more than three years, as, as you say, since mm -hmm. I started here. Uh, and it's been a huge privilege to represent the UK during that time. Uh, I've traveled very widely around Bangladesh. I've met many, many people here in Bangladesh and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I think Bangladesh is an extraordinarily uh, admirable country in all sorts of ways. Uh, I really admire the resilience, fortitude, ingenuity, um, resourcefulness uh, of the people of Bangladesh, which I see everywhere, wherever I go. Uh, it's an extraordinarily hospitable culture. Um, the food is tremendous. Uh, and I think it's a country that is really changing uh, in the most extraordinary way economically. So Bangladesh has obviously gone from having a difficult start in 1971, 1972, uh, to being on the verge of graduating from least developed country status uh, in 2026. Uh, and it's becoming a completely different sort of economy. I mean, you look at the extraordinary uh, ability of the country to mobilize resources, uh, develop a world-class garment industry, revolutionize the agricultural sector, send people abroad to send remittances back. Uh, and I think, you know, the ingenuity that's been shown uh, by the people of Bangladesh collectively uh, is a remarkable thing. And it's an example, I think, in many ways of how getting the, the development basics right on things like uh, population control, um, maternal health, um, infant health, those things can really power uh, economic um, development. Uh, as a country grows. So it's been a fascinating time to be here and I've both found it very interesting professionally, very rewarding professionally, uh, but also um, enormous fun personally uh, to spend the last three years in Bangladesh. That's uh, great, that's great. Uh, recently you said that uh, UK uh, is uh, proud to be a friend of uh, Bangladesh uh, through all the progress we are making. How would you define the current friendship uh, between Bangladesh and UK? No, I think it's a very, a very strong friendship. Uh, I mean, there are, there are many elements to it. We were, we were friends of Bangladesh right from the start of Bangladesh's independent history. And of course, there's a much longer history. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at you know, the, the British presence in South Asia, um, clearly there are good bits to that and there are less good bits to that. But what it gives us is a very strong organic connection. Um, we, uh, the first place that Bangabadu went when he was released by Pakistan at the end of the Liberation War was to come to London. He did his first press conference yeah. as a free man from Claridge's Hotel. He met our then Prime Minister, Edward Heath, who gave his very strong political support to the task of rebuilding an independent country. And it was then the Royal Air Force who flew him back to, back to Dhaka via Delhi to take over the leadership uh, of a newly independent but very badly damaged country. Um, and so we've had that, that relationship right from the start. And I think what we've seen is, is the way that the relationship has evolved from being a relationship that was focused on development very strong development partnership, uh, really right from the start of Bangladesh's independent history, very strong focus on supporting Bangladeshi development in health education. As I said, getting those development basics right, which has been such an important part of Bangladesh's uh, independent history and have been the foundation for the growth that, that has followed. Um, but now I think what we see is a relationship that is evolving. So uh, there's a strong political relationship. Um, I think we're both, you know, obviously we're both Commonwealth members. Uh, we support Commonwealth values. 
Uh, those values clearly are being challenged in all sorts of ways around the world, but I think it's very important that we stand together uh, in supporting them. Uh, and there's very strong people-to-people -people connections. So there's at least 600,000 uh, British people of Bangladeshi descent, including increasingly prominent citizens, four members of the House of Commons, several members of the House of Lords, uh, high court judges, many doctors, engineers, entertainers, footballers, people from all sorts of walks of life. So that's a really strong organic connection uh, between our two countries. And I think as Bangladesh becomes more prosperous, uh, it becomes of more interest to British companies uh, as a market. So we're already the second largest cumulative investor mm -hmm. into Bangladesh, but I think there's scope to do even more of that. And I was very pleased last week that we had uh, Rushnara Ali MP, um, the, our Prime Minister's trade envoy, was in Bangladesh mm -hmm. to talk to people about the opportunities that she sees and how we can work together uh, to develop uh, economic opportunities that benefit both sides. And we have more of a relationship on defence. Uh, we had our first defence dialogue last month, uh, which suggests some ways in which uh, we can work together uh, towards common security objectives. Bangladesh, of course, does an enormously important job as the biggest contributor of UN peacekeepers uh, around the world, including in some very difficult places. So I think there's a whole range of areas where we can work together. And it's been a fantastic privilege as High Commissioner to lead that effort here in Dhaka over the last three years. And uh, Mr. High Commissioner, what are your most challenging uh, moments and successful moments uh, in the last three years in Bangladesh? Well, the most challenging was definitely COVID. You know, COVID, COVID has been a real, of course, it's been a challenge for everyone around the world. It's been a big challenge in the UK uh, and it's been a big challenge in, uh, in Bangladesh as well. But I think for me, the thing that made COVID difficult is normally because we have this very close relationship between the UK and Bangladesh, normally there's very intense, you know, there's a lot of traveling between the two, including by very senior people. And COVID made that more difficult. Uh, and dealing with the consequences of that and trying to keep our diplomacy active and, and busy during that period uh, was difficult. We also had an awkward period at the start of COVID when uh, we were running repatriation flights. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, there were many British Bangladeshis uh, who were stranded here, who, who we needed to get home when the airlines stopped flying. And um, I, I have great respect for the travel business because I realized two years ago as we mobilized that operation, we ran 12 flights, we uh, repatriated uh, over 3,000 uh, British people from Bangladesh, but it was a complicated operation and it was difficult and it made me respect the travel industry for what they make look easy. So that's been the most difficult, COVID and what came after it and recognising the real impact on the economy here and of course knowing that there was a great deal of suffering uh, arising from that. Um, in terms of success, what I've really enjoyed is when, you know, um, visitors, visits go well, you know, because visit, senior visits. Mm -hmm. So we had Lord Ahmed, who is the uh, British Minister for South Asia here last year. We had Rushnara Ali, uh, our trade envoy here last week. We had Helen Grant, who is our Prime Minister's envoy for uh, girls' education here mm -hmm. uh, at the end of last year. So those, those visits have a, have a real value in, uh, they, they sort of crystallise the aspects of the relationship that are most important. And when, you, you know, when we have a successful visit, those provide uh, real sort of highlights uh, in a posting. So it's been great that COVID now allows us to open that up again. As we are talking about uh, the COVID, is there any special plan uh, of the UK government to help Bangladesh uh, recover uh, the losses from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, particularly in the economic and health sector? Well, on the health, we have been, we have been helping. Mm -hmm. uh, we have delivered 5 million vaccines uh, to Bangladesh, and we are in touch with Bangladesh about what we might do next on that. Clearly, there's a very, uh, you know, there's a, a, a big and successful vaccine rollout program here, and we're looking at whether, you know, whether and how we can contribute more to that. It's, it's going well here, but we might, we might be able to offer more. Um, we're also contributing to um, some work that's being done to try to help the health sector here um, respond more effectively. Clearly, everyone, everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. including in the UK, had lessons to learn from how COVID was handled. How do you handle a, you know, an unprecedented pandemic? And uh, we're contributing to some of the lessons that are being learned in the uh, health ministry around that. Um, on the economic side, I mean, I think the best thing that we've been doing is our consumers have continued to buy goods from Bangladesh. There was a very acute stoppage two years ago when mm -hmm. COVID first broke out. And then what the, um, what the garment buyers, so the big stores realized was that despite the disruption, people sitting at home were going online and still buying clothes. Um, and so there was a very quick recovery uh, by, um, 
the, the sector here, the, you know, the, the garment sector here, including with, in the UK as a market. And, uh, and so I think you know, that recovery has, has continued. And I was talking to a representative of one of the big two, actually, of the big British firms who source garments here. And they said business has never been better. So I, mean, I think the success of the Bangladeshi economy through COVID has been uh, you know, a huge achievement. The economy has continued to grow. I know there has been disruption, but if you compare what's happened here with what's happened in other parts of the world, you know, it's a story of, of remarkable success and resilience. Uh, Mr. Robert, since independence, uh, total UK assistance to Bangladesh has uh, crossed uh, three billion uh, pounds. Uh, now that Bangladesh is graduating from LDC, it will no longer be eligible for the UK's uh, official development assistance program. Uh, in your opinion, what will the future economic relationship uh, between UK and Bangladesh look like? Well, it's not quite true, actually. Bangladesh will still be uh, eligible for ODA. Uh, mm -hmm. because uh, official development assistance. Um, the nature of that assistance will change, okay. is changing. Uh, and I think what we will be doing, we have had a history of providing very successful direct delivery uh, through uh, NGO partners here in mm -hmm. Bangladesh, of, uh, particularly of health and education. Uh, and I think we'll be shifting. As, in a way, those sort of programmes uh, cease to be quite as relevant for uh, a country that is graduating from LDC status. But there, is, there are still things that we can do in terms of providing technical help, technical advice. So I think there'll be, there is already uh, a reorientation uh, of our development program taking place. But countries go on being eligible for official development assistance as middle income countries. So the relate, that aspect of the relationship will definitely continue, uh, but it will evolve to look a bit different, reflecting the fact that the country here has changed. Hmm. As you know, uh, the ease of doing business in Bangladesh is quite poor according to international indexes. Uh, what kind of challenges uh, do uh, potential investors face uh, while trying to do business in uh, Bangladesh? Uh, and how can she make her business environment more appealing uh, for foreign investors? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, um, I, th I think it is a problem. Uh, and I think, I think it becomes increasingly a problem after LDC graduation because at the moment foreign direct investment is less than 1% of the GDP of Bangladesh and if the country is going to continue to grow uh, and fulfill its infrastructure needs and development needs as a middle income country then it's going to be important to draw in more private capital and the UK would be a very natural place for that because in the city of London we have some of the biggest deepest pools of capital in the world so I would hope that or I would think that Bangladesh is going to need to draw on both portfolio investment and also on more direct investment into, into uh, factories and services here. Uh, and you're right that being 168th in the World Bank Ease mm -hmm. of Doing Business Register is not the best place to market the country. Uh, and I think the sort of things that business talk to us about, we have an active British business group, some of the largest companies in Bangladesh, some of the biggest taxpayers in Bangladesh are British companies. So we have a good, you know, good discussions with them. And the sort of things that British companies mention when they talk to us, they have problems with the tax authorities, with the National Bureau of Revenue. Uh, they find that the legal system here is slow mm -hmm. uh, and it's difficult to get the sort of clarity that companies need on the protection of their investments. Uh, they aren't always completely confident that their intellectual property will be well protected. Uh, so these are the sort of issues that come up. Uh, and I do think that um, making, making, the, making the overall ease of doing business performance better is going to be really important over the next decade or two for the continued success of Bangladesh as an economy. Uh, Mr. High Commissioner, the UK has invested a lot in the education uh, sector in Bangladesh and uh, however uh, the overall quality of education and uh, especially higher education in Bangladesh is still uh, leaves a uh, lot to be desired. Uh, are there any plans from the UK government uh, to help improve the quality of higher education in Bangladesh and uh, make it more relevant to labour markets uh, demands? Well, we, have a, we, we, we put a big emphasis here on girls' education because all the evidence shows that educating girls, uh, giving girls 12 years of quality education mm -hmm. is one of the best development things you can do. I mean, it, it, benefits, it benefits countries and societies in the most profound way. So we have a big programme here focused on, on educating girls to the end of school. Um, when it comes to higher education... Free of cost. Free, yes, free, yes. I mean, we think that... It's for the state, basically. Mm -hmm. you know, the best model is when the state provides 12 years right. of quality education. So we are supporting, we are supporting working with the government of Bangladesh and with partners like UNICEF to, to help to deliver that. Because, as I said, that's a really great intervention. And, of course, there's a very good track record to build on here in Bangladesh, but there's more that can be done. Um, when it comes to higher education, we don't, we don't directly support through our official development assistance higher education. 
But British universities are very interested in Bangladesh because what they see is a large market. Uh, there are 44 million young people in school here who are the potential university students of tomorrow. Uh, and so they're very interested in the potential of Bangladesh for them to offer courses, offer qualifications, uh, and contribute um, the sort of skills development that Bangladesh is going to need to continue to thrive uh, as, a, as a middle income country. And we would very much welcome a more open market here for British universities to come and freely offer what they, what they do in the way that they do in other countries. So in Malaysia, for example, and in Sri Lanka, uh, British universities have set up arrangements where they can offer their courses to people without those people needing to spend a great deal of time in the UK, which obviously is very expensive. So that hugely increases the access of less prosperous people uh, to the sort of university education that transforms their prospects. So we would very much like, we have had many conversations with the government about this, we would very much like uh, it to be more possible uh, for UK universities to offer their world leading courses, particularly I think in sort of scientific, technical, those sort of those sort of uh, subjects that are going to be really crucially yeah. needed if, if the economy is going to continue to thrive, the export base is going to be diversified. So we think there's a very exciting opportunity and UK universities are definitely interested in coming here. We haven't so far managed to really make it happen, but we're continuing to work on that because I think it's a real opportunity for both sides. Yeah, indeed, that would be a great thing for Bangladesh. Uh, it would be a great thing for both sides yeah, both because the universities sides, are looking yeah. for new, new customers, if you like, mm -hmm. new students. And I think, you know, both Bangladesh as a country, but also obviously individual Bangladeshis mm -hmm. would really benefit mm -hmm. from uh, access to UK university qualifications in Bangladesh. So we are continuing to work on that. Robert, you were recently at a dialogue where you stated that the def uh, defence relations between UK and Bangladesh uh, could be developed in uh, preparation for the next 50 years. What kind of a strategic defence relation can be developed between Bangladesh and uh, the UK? Well, clearly Bangladesh has a, has a strong policy of not joining alliances, so we're not talking about any sort of formal alliance or anything like that. Uh, and I absolutely understand the reasons why, why Bangladesh takes that position. But equally, um, Bangladesh is a strong supporter of the rules-based international system. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the system by which countries can live and cooperate together, trade globally. Uh, and of course, it is that system that has been so appallingly uh, damaged by Russia's illegal, unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. Um, but in terms of the Bangladesh-UK relationship, um, there's a long-standing defence relationship. Um, Bangladesh has for a long time been a customer for UK defence equipment and the UK was uh, deeply involved in the setting up of some of the key institutions for defence in Bangladesh, including the National Defence College and the Staff College here. Uh, but we think we can do more with that. So we think there's more that we can do to help develop um, professional military education in each direction. Uh, and we had a good visit by the um, Commandant of our Staff College earlier in the year. Um, we think there's more that could be done as the Bangladesh Defence Forces are modernised. We think there's more uh, equipment that we can offer which would be of value uh, to enhance Bangladesh's ability to defend its interests. Uh, and we think there's more that could be done on, on doctrine and training mm -hmm. uh, because the world of military affairs is changing very quickly. And we think that there's definitely things that we as partners can do uh, to, uh, to improve the ability of Bangladesh, Bangladesh's armed forces to, to do their job effectively. Uh, and I would just say in that that there is you know, great respect in the UK for the role that Bangladesh plays globally. I mean, Bangladesh is the biggest contributor, as we were saying, biggest contributor of troops to UN peacekeeping operations. They operate alongside British troops in some really tough environments, including uh, Mali. And uh, I think enabling Bangladesh to uh, perform that role even more effectively is obviously something that we can do together to improve uh, Bangladesh's ability to be a, a strong supporter and contributed to the rules-based international system that we all we all live by, and to the UN the UN Charter. With the initiation of uh, uh, AUKUS, uh, we see the UK joining uh, in to establish a level of influence of the ongoing geopolitical dynamics uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, do you believe that there is a role for Bangladesh here, uh, or is Bangladesh's official position, as you have mentioned earlier, of neutrality the best course of action the country can take? Well, I think, uh, I mean, it's for Bangladesh to decide on its, you know, what strategic and defence mm -hmm. uh, arrangements work best for Bangladesh. And I, you know, I have huge respect for the way that Bangladesh navigates these complicated waters. I do think that, in general, uh, it's important to recognise the benefits that we all get 
from freedom of navigation, from the rules that underpin our ability as countries uh, to work together. So I think the rules-based international system, broadly defined, the UN Charter, all the different international agreements that underpin the norms of international life and enable us to, to work and trade and live together, I think those are enormously important. And I think it's very important that we recognise how important those, those things are and continue to uh, support them. Um, I don't think I would necessarily, you know, I think, I think it's, as I said, it's for Bangladesh to take its own decisions on which arrangements work best for it. We, we have decided or recognised that we have very close strategic uh, interests in common with Australia and with the US. And we have already have very close relationships with both countries. Um, we share intelligence through the Five Eyes arrangement. And the Australians are interested in acquiring capabilities, uh, particularly nuclear-powered submarines. Not nuclear-armed, mm -hmm. but nuclear-powered submarines, which is something though, where we, we and, the, and the Americans have been world-leading for 60 years, working very closely together. Uh, and so I think it's an interesting extension of existing patterns of cooperation uh, into new fields. Um, and to me, it looks like a very you know, sensible and pragmatic arrangement for uh, enabling us to work together to continue to support uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific and a rules-based international system. Uh, Mr. High Commissioner, uh, last year we saw the Conference of Parties, COP26, held in Glasgow, uh, which uh, brought uh, together nations around the globe to discuss multilateral actions to con uh, counteract uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, what are your thoughts on the event? Uh, are you satisfied with the various uh, nationally uh, determined contributions unveiled uh, at the event? Well, I think, I think COP26 did just enough. Um, I mean, I think when you add up all the contributions, uh, what COP did was, it was, the role of the conference was to, uh, to give the detail behind the Paris Agreement. And I think we did, we did get there. We didn't get, to be honest, we, we could have got, it would have been great if we could have had more uh, global commitments on, on the phasing out of coal. Uh, we didn't get as far as we had hoped on that. But nonetheless, you know, we got, it's important not to, not to you know, fail to recognise mm -hmm. how far we did get. So COP26 does keep uh, the, the goal of 1.5 degrees alive, but it does set a very demanding pathway for all of us in terms of energy transitions uh, and in terms of um, multinational uh, climate finance. So it's, it, was a, you know, it was a success. Uh, it, was, it was good. I would give it a sort of, you know, at least a beta plus, okay. if, not an, if not an alpha. Uh, but it sets a, you know, a pathway which we're looking, working with our Egyptian friends to, to follow up in, in COP27 at the, at the end of this year. What I would say is that Bangladesh played a very constructive role. As you'll know, the Honourable Prime Minister is the chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And Bangladesh, as a climate vulnerable country, uh, clearly has a leading role in helping to convene other climate vulnerable countries around the world. And we saw that role being played very effectively uh, in Glasgow. And one of the big uh, things on which we will undoubtedly continue to work with Bangladesh in the years ahead is climate. Um, you know, we have a big, we've launched a big uh, climate and environment program, uh, 120 million pounds over the next five years uh, between the UK and Bangladesh. Uh, and I think that will help to power the sort of changes that are needed here in Bangladesh on energy, renewables, uh, electric vehicles, um, green bonds, climate finance, a whole range of, of different things. Uh, it's a very close part of our relationship. Do you believe uh, that uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact will be a pivotal force in order to maintain the targeted 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming? Uh, can such a goal be even uh, met in the first place? And uh, what are your thoughts on net zero carbon emissions by 2050? Well, I think, I think as I said, I think, I think the COP26 sort of did just enough. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been better if it had done even more, but it did, it did enough. Uh, but I think we keep being reminded of the scale of the challenge. I mean, every, almost every day you look in the newspaper and there are weird global events, weird global climate mm -hmm. events taking place. So, I mean, there have been record-breaking temperatures at both, in both the Arctic and the Antarctic in the last month. You know, we've seen more appalling floods in, uh, in Australia. There's a massive drought in the western part of North America. Um, there's a huge drought with tragic consequences in the Horn of Africa. So, you know, there is lots of evidence, I think, of the climate under stress. And there was a very sobering report published by the International Panel on Climate Change yesterday, uh, which demonstrated once again just how big the threat is. So I think, you know, COP26 set out a pathway, which is the right one, but it's very demanding doing all the things that the world, particularly, of course, the big emitters, uh, 
need to do. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. What I would say is that the UK, I think, demonstrates what you can do. You know, we have transformed the way in which we produce power over the last uh, generation from, uh, you know, we've gone from very substantial reliance on coal to almost phasing coal out. Uh, we've massively increased wind, particularly offshore wind, which for us works extremely well as a sort of windy island with a lot of coastline around it. Uh, and we are reinvesting in nuclear, which is uh, a big, uh, a, you know, a big, a big uh, underlying way of generating baseload power uh, without emitting carbon. So we have been, you know, walking the walk uh, in the UK, and there's a big push uh, away from fossil fuel powered. Uh, vehicles towards electric vehicles with some demanding targets to phase out uh, fos phase out internal combustion engines in the in the 2030s. So we are doing what we need to do, but we recognise, of course, that having been a big emitter for a long time, uh, the onus is on us as a, as a relatively prosperous country to move quickly. Here is another big issue for Bangladesh. Uh, the UK has already uh, given target uh, sanctions to the Myanmar military and has been uh, providing aid to Bangladesh to allow us uh, to shelter Rohingya refugees. Uh, will the effect of the war in Ukraine and uh, the aid being sent to Ukraine have an impact on the level of aid being sent to deal with the Rohingya crisis? Uh, well, I think it's fair to say, I mean, the, the joint response plan uh, was launched uh, in Geneva last week. So, you know, the world, the, the UN has put out the appeal uh, for the resources that it needs uh, to, uh, to support the Rohingya population here in Bangladesh. And we've announced our own contribution to that. Um, but I think it's a sad fact, as you say. I mean, there is massive competition at the moment for humanitarian resources because Ukraine is an appalling, unprecedented, mm -hmm. really, since the Second World War act of aggression with massive consequences. I mean, there are four or five million refugees who flowed out of, ref out of Ukraine and they need to be supported. Um, of course, we also are dealing with a tragic situation in Afghanistan, which uh, has come up over the last year with, the, with, the, uh, with the, the Taliban taking power with very serious humanitarian consequences. And of course, there are long running crises in, Ukraine, in Yemen, um, in Syria and in places like Tigray. So I'm afraid the sad fact is the world is quite disordered at the moment and that has terrible humanitarian consequences. Uh, and I think what that means for the response here is that it's even more important that the uh, the resources are spent and allocated in a way that gets the maximum value out of every dollar that goes in. Uh, and so we're working with the UN, uh, with agencies and with the government here to try to make sure that that is the case. Uh, because I think, you know, the Rohingya situation is tragic. It's very important that it's not yeah. forgotten. Uh, we are big political supporters of repatriation. Clearly the right solution for the mm -hmm. Rohingyas is that they return to their homes in Rakhine as soon as they can do so in a way that is safe, dignified and voluntary. Uh, but the sad fact is that very few, virtually none, uh, currently feel able mm -hmm. to go back. And the Rohingyas I've spoken to in the camps have always said, well, we want to return, but we recognise we can't mm -hmm. do it yet. And I think you know, Bangladesh has been extraordinarily generous in the way that they've been looked after here over the last five years. Uh, and I think you know, there is obviously a, it's, it's a terrible situation for the Rohingyas. It's very difficult for Bangladesh. And I think the key... Uh, now is to support the refugees in a way that enables them to have purpose in their lives. Uh, no one wants to be in a refugee camp, but I think the more that the adults are able to earn a living in a dignified way, keep their communities clean and tidy through volunteering, and the children can be educated in the Rohingya language, that's really important to making sure that the children are able to return in due course, ready to resume their lives uh, in Rakhine. How can international communities invest in Rakhine to create an environment conducive uh, to the repatriation of the uh, Rohingya people? Well, I think the first thing will be security, and we'll, you know, for that, uh, we will need the agreement of the of the government in uh, in Myanmar that, that this should take place. They too need to make it a priority. If I'm honest, um, we don't see a huge amount of cause for optimism with the current. Uh, government in, in Myanmar. I mean, it was a government that took power in a military coup. Uh, it's, it's obviously launched a pretty savage re policy of repression against its own people. Uh, and so it's not an easy government with whom to do business on, on, on repatriation. Uh, but clearly, if you had a government that changed its mind, that was willing to acknowledge that the Rohingyas have a legitimate place in Rakhine and, and should be citizens of uh, Myanmar and able to live their lives there, a lot could be done. These crises can be solved. We've seen in other parts of Southeast Asia over decades that 
you know, big refugee problems that seem intractable, including, for example, the problem of Cambodian refugees in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. That problem, which originally had, you know, there were huge refugee camps in Thailand particularly. Eventually those problems were solved and the refugees were able to go home. So it can happen. With the right political will, it can happen. Uh, but um, I wouldn't pretend that it's, it's looking promising in the short term in, uh, in Myanmar at the moment. Uh, Mr. Robert Dixon, in an address to the press in Bangladesh, you once quoted uh, George Orwell, uh, quote, freedom of the press, if it means anything at all, means the freedom to criticize and oppose, unquote. What, in your opinion, is the current environment for press uh, freedom in Bangladesh? How do you see the implementation of the controversial Digital Security Act 2018? Uh, well, I think freedom of the press is, is, is vital. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously provided for uh, in, the, um, in the 1972 constitution here. Uh, I mean, I think it's an essential part of a democratic process is that you have a press who can, mm -hmm. as George Orwell said, uh, oppose and criticize. And certainly the press in the UK uh, is very active in opposing and criticizing the government, which is absolutely uh, what it should be able to do. Um, I think if I'm honest, when I talk to people in, in Bangladesh, when I talk to journalists here in Bangladesh, they tell me that they feel constrained in some of what they can report. Um, and the, uh, there's an international organization called Reporters Without Borders, which produces an index of press freedom. Mm -hmm. And their report indicates some of the concerns uh, that uh, I recognize about the problem, you know, the issues surrounding press freedom here in Bangladesh. And we have made clear, I mean, we think that the Digital Security Act has a chilling effect on, on media freedom and, and freedom of speech in Bangladesh and I've joined other ambassadors here uh, in talking to the law minister about ways in which the Digital Security Act might be changed in a way that would make it less uh, repressive mm -hmm. of, of the freedom of the media. And uh, what in your opinion is the state of liberal democracy in uh, Bangladesh? Uh, the last national elections in Bangladesh uh, have been admired uh, in uh, controversies. Uh, are there any plans for the United uh, Kingdom government to observe the fairness of the upcoming elections? Well, I think as friends of Bangladesh, as I said earlier on, you know, we are very close friends of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And I think as friends, we will be taking a close interest in the next election. Uh, I mean, we would expect the next election, clearly the timetable calls for the next election to be right at the end of next year or very beginning of 2024. And I, as I said, as friends, we will, be, we will take a close interest in the process. And I think if I can just elaborating on that a little bit. I think there are sort of four, there are four phases, I think, of an election that are important. There's the first phase, which has already started, where mm -hmm. before an election, everybody, all the political parties, all points of view have the ability to express themselves freely. Parties can organize, they can hold rallies, they can do the things that political parties need to do uh, to play their part in the democratic process. And that continues, obviously, mm -hmm. right up to and through uh, the election itself. I think it's then very important that people are confident that they can go to the polling station and cast their vote uh, without anyone stopping them or interfering with that. There's then obviously the third thing is, uh, will pe can people be confident that their vote will be counted uh, in a transparent and, and honest way? And that's very important to any democratic process. Uh, and then the final point is, uh, can w w is there confidence that the, the parties to the election will accept the result? So when the election result comes out clearly, is it accepted that uh, by everyone concerned that you know, the election was free and fair uh, and the government should result from that? So I think those are the four sort of phases, stages, if you like, stages. the stages. And, and as friends, as I said, we will be taking a close interest uh, in, in how those stages play out uh, here in Bangladesh. Because I do think that the next election is going to be really important um, because mm -hmm. it will the, the government that takes power at the next election will be the one that goes through... LDC graduation. LDC graduation. LDC graduation is a huge achievement, but it's a milestone, not a finishing post. And I think there are many challenges. Actually. There are many challenges, and I think having a having a a, a well-founded democratic system is by far the best uh, basis on which to draw in international investment. I think a well-founded, yeah. well-functioning democratic system will give investors the confidence to put their money into Bangladesh. Uh, and by contrast, if that is not present, then I think it will make it harder. Uh, to uh, attract the funds that are going to be needed to keep the country powering ahead economically. Indeed. Uh, recently, Shanan uh, Rajib Bakht was elected as the city of London's uh, second British Bangladeshi councillor. What are your thoughts on the future of the Bangladeshi diaspora in the UK? Well, I think it's thriving. Uh, I mean, uh, it's obviously great that we have another council. I've met 
the first councillor in the city of London. Uh, there are actually many, there are many, mm -hmm. many Bangladeshis already serving as, uh, as councillors at, in, at lo in local government across the UK. Uh, and of course, we have four uh, members of parliament, parliament four elected yeah. members of parliament uh, who are very prominent. Um, Tulip Sadiq has been very prominent in the media recently because her constituent, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, was being mm -hmm. held by, by the Iranian government and was released recently to considerable uh, acclaim. And obviously, Tulip Sadiq was, was prominent in that. Um, and then there are members of the House of Lords, uh, there are judges, there are doctors. Uh, it's an increasingly uh, visible, confident uh, part of the great mixture of people that makes up uh, the population of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think what's wonderful is that they are able to contribute as citizens of the UK uh, and in increasingly prominent positions, uh, while also being um, you know, proud of their links and heritage in Bangladesh. So that gives us a wonderful organic connection, mm -hmm. which for the 50th anniversary, we've had this phrase in the uh, High Commission, we've described it as the Brit Bangla Bondon, the ties between the UK and, and, uh, and Bangladesh. And having Rushnara Ali mm -hmm. MP, who is our uh, Prime Minister's trade envoy to Bangladesh last week, was just a reminder of how, you know, how great a thing that is uh, in giving us a really powerful relationship uh, with, with this country. Uh, the holy month of Ramadan is underway. Uh, do you want to say anything to the Muslim population of Bangladesh? Yes, well, I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm not a Muslim myself, but I have profound respect for Islam. Uh, I think it's an extraordinary uh, religion. I can absolutely see the, the, the power that it has in people's lives. And I always feel that what Ramadan does is to test people's fortitude uh, mm -hmm. and test their attachment uh, to the principles of Islam, to the five principles. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's a remarkable, I admire enormously uh, the way that people come through the test that Ramadan very deliberately uh, puts into their lives. Uh, and I think it's just one sign of the uh, remarkable way in which Islam shapes people's lives, I think, without dominating. Mm -hmm. uh, Bangladesh, obviously, is a, a country with very strong secular principles. It's a country where people uh, with all sorts of religions can practice those religions freely. I've seen all sorts of different uh, religious communities here. Uh, but I have huge admiration uh, for Islam uh, as, a, as a religion and as a way of life. Uh, and I think that Ramadan is a time when one is more conscious than ever uh, of, the, of the positive force of, of Islam uh, as, a, as a system of, of religion. Any final words for the viewers? Well, no, just to say how much, you know, what a privilege it's been, it is, to live in Bangladesh. I'm very pleased that I've got probably about another year in Bangladesh, so my time here is not over. But I've had an absolutely wonderful time here. I've got huge uh, respect and affection for Bangladesh uh, as a place uh, to live and work and huge admiration for the progress that the country is making. So it's a wonderful privilege, really, to be able to be part of that by representing the UK uh, here in Dhaka. Thank you, High Commissioner. Thank you for your illuminating uh, insights. Uh, uh, dear viewers, uh, there has always been a significant uh, overlap between the histories of the United Kingdom and uh, Bangladesh. However, it may be fair to say that uh, at the current stage, UK, Bangladesh uh, relations have been the strongest and most positive as it has ever been. Uh, the generous amount of donation and support from the UK government has been instrumental uh, in economic and cultural growth in Bangladesh. Uh, now, uh, as uh, Bangladesh recovers from the effects of the pandemic and uh, resumes her unprecedented economic uh, growth, there is no doubt that future economic, military and cultural ties between the UK and Bangladesh will flourish. However, in order for us to reach that stage, significant challenges uh, as uh, High Commissioner mentioned, uh, must be overcome. Uh, the threat of climate change, the regression of democratic values in the name of development, and the lingering effects of the Rohingya refugee crisis will all negatively affect Bangladesh society and economy. We hope that our strong ties to the UK will help us mitigate uh, some of these negative effects and allow us to form the mutually beneficial relationship we both aspire for. Uh, that's all the time for today. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Please look forward for more to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us.